late May 1815. Exiled to Elba in 1814, Napoleon had returned in March and is once again Emperor of the French. Europe, committed to restoring the old order, has declared war on Napoleon. They plan to invade France and restore the monarchy. The Russian and Austrian armies are approaching from the east. The Anglo-Dutch army under Wellington is headquartered in Brussels. The Prussian army under Blücher is headquartered in Namur. Napoleon is vastly outnumbered. King Louis XVIII has fled France and set up court in Ghent, 60 kilometers west of Brussels. From Ghent, the king's agents and spies have infiltrated Napoleon's government and army. The role of Fouché is well known, plotting Napoleon's downfall from the moment he returned to France. However, there were many others. The king also has spies and agents in the French army, many in direct communication with Ghent, providing intelligence. Along the frontier, the king has stationed officers to collect deserters and sow discord. One such officer was the Marquis de Castry, a former aide-de-camp of Davou, now stationed in Namur, whose staff included a former curassier, Friedrich Rie. Napoleon faced a severe shortage of horses, and the financial situation was perilous. An insurrection was raging in the Vendée, requiring troops to be dispatched to the interior. Once the Allies invaded, his military situation would arguably be better than in 1814. But his political situation was unstable. He needed an event to rally the country around him before the Allied invasion. Brussels was the answer. A lightning stroke to seize the Belgian capital and possibly return Belgium to France would captivate the nation. Traitors would be shaken from the army, and Napoleon would gain the political stability necessary to deal with those in government. Napoleon decided to strike. On June 3rd, Napoleon ordered Marshal Sou, who was Napoleon's Major General, commander of the army headquarters and responsible for distributing his orders, to bring Gerard's 4th Corps from Metz to Philippeville. Napoleon also reorganized the cavalry, taking divisions attached to the infantry corps and creating four cavalry corps under the overall command of Marshal Grouchy. On June 4th, Sou gave a detailed report to Napoleon of the locations of the infantry corps of Army de Nord and the time required to reach the staging areas for an invasion. First corps at Maubeuge, two-day march, leaving on the 11th. Second corps to the right of Maubeuge on the Sombre, one-day march, leaving on the 12th. Third corps north of Philippeville, two-day march, leaving on the 12th. 4th Corps at Philippeville, 7 or 8 day march, leaving on the 6th. 6th Corps, previously indicated to be at Avene, 5 day march, leaving on the 9th. Imperial Guard at Avene, staggered march, arriving on the 13th. Everything was planned so the army would be in position by the evening of the 12th, to be moved into final positions on the 13th and launched on the Sombre on June 14th, the anniversary of the victories of Morongo and Friedland. Napoleon planned to come between the Anglo-Dutch and Prussian armies. The French army, vastly superior to either Allied army, would compel the Allies to retreat, as neither could survive a battle on their own. Napoleon would occupy Brussels by June 16th. A thunderclap heard across Europe. The king would be chased from the continent and the traitors purged from his government and army. On June 5th, Sue issued the orders to Gerard, 
plans they had been adjusted to have the 4th Corps arrive in Roqua by June 13th. The Emperor has ordered me to inform you that his plan is that you begin the Army de la Moselle's march upon receipt of this order, that is to say, 7th of June, and that you direct it following the itinerary attached to Roqua, where it must be on the 13th of this month, without fail. On June 6th, Sue sent orders to the rest of the army. First Corps was ordered to be ready to march within three hours of receiving orders. Second Corps was ordered to concentrate near Maubeuge by June 13th. Third Corps was ordered to concentrate between Marienburg and Chimay by June 13th. Fourth Corps was already ordered to require by June 13th. Sixth Corps was ordered to Aven by June 13th. The Guard had already been ordered to Aven, and Groshi's four reserve cavalry corps were also ordered into position. Napoleon had ordered the formation of two columns on the frontier and planned to use the day of June 13th to put the army into a final position. He had positioned the army so that it could cross the Sambre at Maubeuge and fall on Mont, or it could cross at Chalois. Either location would put Napoleon on a major road to Brussels and place the French army between Wellington and Blücher. On June 7th, Napoleon ordered Sue to Lille to assure the security of the French frontier west of the planned advance. By June 11th, Sue was ordered to return to Law in order to meet Napoleon on June 12th. On June 10th, Napoleon finalized the concentration. With Sue absent, Bertrand, Grand Marshal of the Palace, would be responsible for the dictation and distribution of the orders. Two orders would be written that day. The first, position the army in a square south of Maubeuge, with a corner of the square pointing directly at Mont. The second order written put the army in three balanced columns on roads to Charleroi. It is this second order that Bertrand distributed to the army generals. The plans for Mons existed only as a draft on Bertrand's notes and an original sent to Sue. These orders were sent to Long, where Sue was expected to arrive on June 11th. Did Napoleon change his mind? Or was the order to advance on Mont a carefully constructed ruse meant to fool the Allies? Fouché claimed he had an agent steal the plans of the campaign, a claim that Sir Walter Scott confirmed during the occupation of Paris after Waterloo. However, Fouché was playing both sides, and he arranged for the interception of these plans at the border. If the Allies defeated Napoleon, Fouché would say he tried to steal the plans, but if Napoleon won, he would say he captured a spy. During June, the Allies repeatedly heard rumours of an attack on Mons. Is it possible Napoleon was giving the Allies and their agents in Paris false information in order to keep Wellington west of Charleroi? There are a couple of facts that support the Mons plan as a ruse. First, unlike the Charleroi plan, all of the positions given are imprecise. Second Corps is to the rear of Maubeuge. First Corps is near and to the rear. Third Corps is to the right, etc. This is unlike any order Napoleon sent in 1815. And the Charleroi plan, the one actually sent to the generals, is absolutely precise, with a location for each formation's headquarters. Second, Grouchy had recently been given command of the newly organized Cavalry Corps and Fourth Corps, and had been recently ordered to join the Army de Nord. Napoleon could hope that the Allies were unaware of these events, and both are excluded from the Mons plan letter Bertrand addressed to Sue. On June 11th, Sue, for reasons unknown, remained at Aven. He was not in law when Napoleon's orders arrived, and he would only receive them late in the day of June 12th in Aven. Considerable time was lost, as the courier must have waited in long for Sue's arrival until it was clear he was not coming. Sue initially began executing the orders for the advance on Charleroi, but then switched to the plan for more. 
had two orderlies been sent to law, but arrived in a van in reverse order, thus confusing Sue? Or had Sue received the intercepted false Mons orders after the Charleroi orders? Whatever the event, Sue had adopted the Mons plan, contrary to Napoleon's final wishes. Napoleon left Paris on June 12th and arrived in Aven on June 13th. He immediately countermanded Sue's orders and ordered the army into the three columns for an advance on Charleroi. As Sue plainly said to Van Damme, according to the orders that I sent to you yesterday, you were to gather your army corps in Beaumont. But the Emperor has again ordered the execution of the Order of the Day from the 10th of which I sent you the appellation, according to which you were to gather your troops during the day of the 13th in front of Philippeville. It is thus the dispositions of the order given by the Emperor on the 10th that you must follow. The rest of the army was given similar orders. Due to the delays introduced by Sue not being in law and giving the wrong orders, Napoleon would delay the advance until June 15th. Van Damme would receive the orders too late and Napoleon would order him to remain in Beaumont, thus overloading the center column. Napoleon used June 14th to move the army closer to the frontier. Napoleon heard from his spies that the Allies had not moved on June 13th or June 14th. He had every reason to believe he had achieved his goal of concentrating his army on the Sombre without Wellington or Blücher knowing. At 11.30 p.m., Neissenau, the Prussian chief of staff, began the concentration of the Prussian army. French traitors had informed him of the impending attack. The 12 plus hours gained allowed the Prussians to field an army at Sombrev. As the great Prussian historian Leto Vorbeck states, without this treason committed by members of the French army, the surprise intended by Napoleon would have been successful to an even stronger degree than was the case now. Though delayed and worried about the advance via Mons, the gathered Prussian army allowed Wellington to order the concentration of his army at Quatre Bras without fears of immediate destruction. Napoleon's plan was to prevent Allied cooperation. But not only were Wellington and Blücher working together on June 16th, they literally were able to meet in person. Napoleon believed on June 16th he would push a single Prussian corps aside and force march that night with his guard to Brussels. But instead of facing no major battles, the French ended up fighting too. Ney and Wellington met at Quatre Bois and fought to a stalemate, while Napoleon defeated Blücher at Ligny. However, on June 18th, the Allied armies were joined and would deal Napoleon a decisive defeat at Waterloo. French traitors had destroyed Napoleon's plan, but the root of this destruction was the delay which allowed the King's agents in the French army to tip off the Prussians. Had Napoleon kept to his original schedule, the French army would have crossed the Sombre and occupied the nivelle namur road. Wellington and Blücher would have had their communications greatly impacted and would not have been able to coordinate a defence. Napoleon would have occupied Brussels, or had either army chosen to give battle, destroyed it. The delay was caused by Sioux remaining in Aven and the confusion caused by two orders. What was the purpose of the Mons order? Had Napoleon changed his mind? or had a carefully constructed ruse gone horrifically bad. On June 22, 1815, Napoleon signed his abdication. It is believed that this took place in the Salon d'Argent in the Palais d'Elysée, Napoleon's residence during the 100 days. The Salon d'Argent is in the rear of the palace, on its eastern side. If he signed his abdication here, it is possible the Salon d'Argent served as his office during 1815. Adjacent to the office is a staircase. Napoleon would be exiled to St. Helena, joined by his faithful companion Bertrand. In 1821, after Napoleon's death, Bertrand returned to Europe, arriving in Portsmouth on August 1st. 
On August 6th, Bertrand and his family travelled to London, where they took residence at Brunette's Hotel of Leicester Square, along with Montholon and his family. During their stay in England, Bertrand and Montholon were often visited by various officers and government officials. On September 15th, John Cam Hobhouse visited Bertrand, and he recounted his visit in his diary. I called with D. Kinnaird on Count Bertrand at Brunette's Hotel. Found him and his Countess, his brother, and another person there. The Countess, ill with a cough, a pale, tall, thin, agreeable-looking woman of a certain age. The Count, very solicitous about her health. Bertrand drew near to me and spoke frankly about my book. Said the Emperor saw at once that il sautait de la classe, that he saw I had a recourse to good informants, that he at first had resolved to answer the book and to correct many points of which he alone has knowledge, having the reins of government and could give a just account, that he observed I had altered my opinions as to the libre in the second edition, and had seen that they did wrong to suspect the Emperor had to debate about liberty when they should be defending their country against the foreigners. This alluded to a note which Constant furnished me with. Bertrand told me that the reason why Napoleon discontinued writing his remarks on my book was, first, he took up the employment and wrote those things which all the world knows. I did not ask him what he really wrote, but Montholon told Kinnaird that he wrote the account of the Battle of Waterloo, which Phillips published. The other reason was that he could not write on my book without exposing the treachery of many men still about the French court, which he did not wish to do. I said, Fouché, for instance. Yes, said Bertrand. I myself introduced by the back stairs to Napoleon, the courier who had Fouché's dispatches to the enemy, eight days before the Battle of Waterloo. Eight days before the Battle of Waterloo, on June 10th, 1815, Napoleon and Bertrand, who were consumed with preparing the final concentration of orders for the campaign in Belgium, apprehended an agent, a Fouché, carrying dispatches to the enemy.